I don't know if you've realized this, but I'm a little bit gifted differently than Jordan or Brad or Olivia. Like we, we all are different up here, right? And that's good. We celebrate that, how the Lord has gifted his people with different spiritual gifts. And those gifts come out as people are teaching up here. So we are thankful to be part of a church where we can be edified by the full spiritual gifts that God has given us. Um, as we jump into John today, we're going to actually be jumping into John chapter 7. So if you want, you can turn in your Bibles to John chapter 7. Uh, we believe that God has given us his word to teach us what it means to follow Jesus. Jesus who's the full revelation of who God is. What it means to follow Jesus and also what it means to kind of invite others on that journey of following him as well. So we are thankful to have God's word and we're thankful on a Sunday morning, us along with thousands, millions of other people around the world this morning are opening God's word and asking what does it mean for us to orient our whole lives around what God's revealing to us today, right? So we're part of like, it's really cool when you, you pause. There are people all over the world sitting right now and they will be sitting later or they already have sat depending on the time zone around God's word. It's beautiful. Uh, so what I actually want to invite you to do, before you're open your Bible, John chapter 7. Now, spoiler, before we read it, they're going to be talking about the Feast of the Tabernacles. But I actually just want to invite you at your tables for a moment to share a story about the best festival that you've been to or the best fair experience. Does that make sense? Festival, fair, that type of thing. Circus. Circus. If you've been to a circus, show, you can talk about circus. But at your tables, just share a story about that, okay? Share a story of an experience you've had at a festival, a circus, a fair, like a gathering in the community. You're all looking at me like, what's a fair? What's a <laughs> you know what I'm asking you? Yes. Okay, so go ahead. Share those stories at your table. <laughs> Michael Bisons does it. Do you want to come over here and talk about circuses? Actually, I Yeah, but there's not any worry. 
All right, I'll give y'all a couple more minutes. I mean, not minutes. I'm going to give you a couple more moments. A couple more moments. Can we get the definition of the length of the moment? Oh wait, what? Yeah. We can just jump in. Yeah. This is how I should go with this. I have it. It's like. All right, I'm gonna pull us together. I hear talk of a cow onesie, and that's off topic from the festival. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is a four festival. Festival. Oh my goodness. Potentially. All right. Well, at the tables, does anybody have a story they want to share of a festival that, or you want to t have somebody else share a story about a festival that they think the whole church needs to hear about? Anybody? Jordan. The pork festival. A pageant, a pig pageant. Oh, it's four people. <laughs> the pork festival queen. Wow, I love it. What else? What else? Any others? I went to the Renaissance Fair one time. The Renaissance Fair. Is that in Dublin? I don't know. That was really small. Really, really small. I do remember there was a guy in one of those like. There's so many weird stocks. Put your stocks. hands. Is that what's called? Stocks. Your head. Oh yeah, the stocks. Yeah. And we threw tomatoes at him. You oh. threw tomatoes at a guy. Yeah. yeah. That's Commitment. Yeah. Anything else, Randy? I heard you sharing a story. I'm gonna you share it. What? Of the festival you were talking, or the fair. Which one? <laughs> the the rock. Were you just sharing about the rock? I'll share it now. I thought I heard her talking about it. There's a if Susanna was here, she'd be going crazy right now because she that's what I thought you're talking about. She's talking about the Circleville Pumpkin Festival. That's what she's talking about. In Sugar Creek, Ohio, there is something called the Swiss Festival where they celebrate Swiss cheese. Heinie's cheese, all the cheeses, Gugasburg cheese. But they also do this event called the Stein Toss. You know what a Stein is? Yeah, it's a German word for like a mug. rock. Oh. <laughs> rock. So they, do you remember how heavy they are? I think the guy's boulder is like 100 pounds. And so, and the, yeah, the woman's like 50 or 60. And literally, it's just a contest of who can throw it the farthest. So usually, they're try, they try to get it above their head, and they get a running start, and then they throw it at the line, and they see who can throw it the farthest. Sometimes people drop it on themselves. Oh my it's crazy. The reason I bring up festivals is it's to begin to help us get a picture of what's happening here, but we don't really have context for something like the Feast of the Tabernacles, which is what this passage starts with. So um, I'm going to actually read from here. You can read with me. And we're going to jump right into God's Word. So I'll read, and then we'll pray, and we're going to jump in. So after this, after this being, do you remember what happened last week? A bunch of Jesus' disciples just left him. Like Jesus got left high and dry by his disciples because of his teaching was so hard to accept. So kind of have this remaining group of the 12 who are still following, but a lot of, not just the crowd, his disciples left him. And it says not just a few disciples, many disciples left him. So after this, Jesus went around in Galilee. He did not want to go about in Judea because the Jewish leaders there were looking for a way to kill him. But when the Jewish festival of tabernacles was near, Jesus' brother said to him, Leave Galilee and go to Judea, so that your disciples there may see the works you do. No one who wants to become a public figure acts in secret. Since you are doing these things, show yourself to the world, for even his own brothers did not believe in him. Therefore Jesus told them, My time is not yet here, for you any time will do. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify that its works are evil. 
you go to the festival, I'm not going up to this festival because my time has not yet fully come. After he said this, he stayed in Galilee. So that's where we're gonna to stop today. Uh, will you pray with me? Holy Spirit, we thank you for this word that has been read and heard. And I pray that it would find fertile soil within our hearts. So Lord, whatever worries we have that we maybe we're carrying in this morning, maybe we can feel that tension in our shoulders right now. We offer that to you. Whatever worries we have uh, in the day, days ahead, weeks ahead, we give those to you. And Lord, we just ask that you would speak to us. Holy Spirit, um, show up and help us to show up as we listen to your voice. Jesus, we love you. We pray this all in your name. Amen. So the Feast of Tabernacles, there's this guy named Josephus. He was a historian at the time that Jesus was living. He called the Feast of Tabernacles the greatest and holiest of the Feast of the Jews. And this was an eight-day feast. So what would happen is Jewish people from all over would come into Jerusalem for an eight-day festival. Eight days of this. Everyone's engaged. This isn't just something where I think most of us who've gone to the festival, like you kind of pop in for a couple hours and then you're, you're done for the week. Like everyone's full on engaged for eight days. And what they're celebrating or what they're remembering is the Lord's provision for God's people as they wandered through the desert. We talked about that last week, how the Lord continued to provide for his people, even in the midst of a time of testing and trial. That's the time they're remembering. They're, they're meditating on how the Lord showed up. They're meditating on how their faith was tested and strengthened. And then this feast is also kind of matched with the agricultural rhythm. So it's intentionally placed and paired with the harvest that comes in the fall. So if any of you talked about these fall festivals, a lot, a lot of us celebrate fall, like pumpkin festival, that's a fall festival. Uh, it's matched with that to, again, highlight that theme of God's provision that comes in the harvest, right? So another name for this, ta this feast is actually the Feast of Booths. Has anyone heard of that? Sarah, Brad, yeah, I, I'm surprised. I didn't even know if anybody would. It's also called the Feast of Booths. And the reason in scripture sometimes will be given that name. The reason it's called that is literally the people who would be coming into Jerusalem, they would build these makeshift booths out of branches, just as they did. And you I'm getting some head nods. Have you built this booth? No, there's there's a there's one of my favorite children's books author is Jewish, and so she wrote a story about them doing this in like modern times. To celebrate the feast. Yes. Steven, everybody well, knows about the feast. Really? <laughs> the, cho the Chosen. The Chosen. Uh, I'm behind the times. <laughs> the Chosen ruined this moment. <laughs> you should have watched The Chosen well, before you gave your We should just watch The Chosen right now. <laughs> just hang it up. <laughs> well, for those of you, literally, they're living in booth. Some people, I'm getting some confirmation. We don't all know this. So I'm not the only crazy one. This is like, I have no idea. Actually, I built one. You built one? <laughs> you do have a builder. Yes. 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 <laughs> okay. Well, just picture this. <laughs> let's, just, let's try to bring this image back. Imagine you're not just at a festival. People are literally living here in these makeshift booths and celebrating the Lord's provision. So that's what Jesus' brothers are asking him to go up to. Like that is just literally not, I'm, I, this, I did not say this to be cheesy. That is like ripe for the picking in terms of gathering a following, right? There are people gathered from all over and associated with the Feast of Tabernacles or Feast of Booths are actually this, the word is, have you guys heard the word eschatological? That's a theological word basically meaning for end times. In Zechariah 14, we see that the Jewish, there's this prophecy that the Israel people were expecting a future where all the nations of the world would come to Jerusalem to celebrate this feast under one new king, right? 
So this is like, when we think about Jesus, who is the king of the world, it's like, this is your moment, Jesus. Go up. The nations will come under you. That's like, that's context for this moment. So what we're going to actually be exploring is Jesus and his brothers. I might need someone to jump into the booth. There we go. We got two competing strategies going on right here. Jesus's ways are very different than his brothers. And to set up this moment, this passage is coming not on just the heels, or it's coming on the heels of Jesus's, many of Jesus's own disciples leaving him. And now we find out that two Jesus' own brothers don't believe him and quite understand what he's about. And just think for a moment with me how lonely, how lonely of a life that would have been at that time for Jesus. He's got this scraggly group of 12 who are barely hanging on. His own family doesn't even kind of get what's going on. I was looking up some quotes on this, and it, it, even Charles Darwin, he says, the loss of friends is one of the most severe blows which can befall any man. And that's what Jesus is going through right now. And I can only imagine how much that heightens the weight of this temptation to give in to what his brothers are suggesting. So in a sense, his brothers are telling him to, to get, get bigger. Gather this crowd that you've just lost. You literally just lost your following. Like that feeding on the, the hill, they all left you. But they're, everyone's gathered again in Jerusalem. You can go You can go manufacture this and get the gathering big again. It's funny, as a, as a church plant, uh, if you were to talk with Anderson's, G's, McCain's, as we're moving here, and we began the planting process, a question you often get as a church planner, and you continue to get as a church planner, then you continue to get it and as a church leader, is the question around numbers. How do you make money? How, what, how do you make money? Yeah. Yes. All the, all the numbers questions. It is pressed into our minds to measure the value or the success of something of God according to how many are following it. And by that metric, Jesus fails right here. He is an utter failure. Utter failure. And you know what? He's not anxious about it. That's what's remarkable. He is not anxious about this moment. So they're telling him to gather that. We see throughout scripture that the things of God often have small beginnings, right? Jesus teaches on the faith of a mustard seed, just the tiniest bit of faith. Mustard seed's really, really tiny, grows into something beautiful. We see in the Old Testament, Gideon. Gideon is supposed to lead these soldiers into battle and God basically leads him through this process of dwindling down his numbers from many to a few. He's like, go have them drink at the water and those who drink from their hands from the water instead of uh, those who put their face literally in the water, those are the ones you're going to take. And suddenly his, his army is dwindling, yet the Lord achieves victory that day with few members. And we literally see with Jesus his ministry continues to kind of dwindle in a sense. It includes big crowds, but think about who's with him at the cross. Literally his 12 have left him too, except John and the women that have been following him, they are there too. The women honestly are the most faithful in a lot of ways when we see the picture that the gospels paint about Jesus' disciples, those who are following him. And yet that was the small beginning that the church exploded out of, right? So what do we see Jesus saying in response to this? Jesus is confident because he has this believing remnant of disciples that he, this 12, even though he knows it'll dwindle down, he knows that 11 of those 12 will remain. And we see that this conviction, it comes out of actually the last chapter. Uh, Peter has just said this to Jesus. Jesus knows their hearts. Peter has said, we have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. God is not against numbers. 
It, the things of God often include numbers. It can include big crowds, but it often does not start there. It starts with a believing core, and God is more interested in the hearts of a, of a committed few than a shaky crowd that is uncommitted. At the heart of this, honestly, and this will lead us into our next point, I don't know if anybody has read the book, Not a Fan by Kyle Eidelman. That, that would be like, rooted in this passage. I actually haven't read that book, but the the core of that book essentially is that Jesus does not just want fans. He wants committed followers who truly believe in him. And that belief is not just a one-time belief. It is an active daily trust, an active daily obedience to Jesus' teachings and surrendering my life to that so that his life can become my life. So competing strategy number two. They're telling Jesus to, in a sense, be better. Go, show yourself to the world. What's interesting is Jesus' brothers were probably there at the wedding in Cana when he changed the water into wine. They were there at the beginning, the very first. They've seen what Jesus can do, and they're saying, Dude, brother, we have seen you turn water into wine. If you do anything like that when all that crowd in all the booths throughout Jerusalem, if they see that, that was kind of a secret among the wedding crowd, that only a few people knew what happened, you, you'll you have your gathering up in a second. You'll be influencing the masses. You will be a, a truly a king among the commoners, right? And again, think about how many times in our our walk with Jesus, we measure the authority or validity of somebody's words or life based on how much they impress us. We even see that, honestly, ironically, I was talking about this with Sarah Jose and the in law, Julie, the in laws, Randy, yesterday about how churches, uh, different church traditions will elevate certain gifts and other gifts are de-elevated. Kind of depends on what church or what tradition you're in. Different ones are elevated. And it's that same sense. If you're in a certain community, certain gifts are given influence and power, and the other ones are literally disregarded. And the temptation is to not give authority to that. Or think about, we talk about how a, a joke, I've, this phrase has often been said at our church, that kids are not given a junior Holy Spirit. They have the same Holy Spirit within them that we do, right? And yet there's something that causes us to disregard the potential wisdom or truth that can come from the mouth of a child. Yet Jesus tells us to learn from the child, right? There is this humility that is counter to the world in terms of placing ourselves under the teaching of the Lord. And that teaching often comes from places that surprise us. Right? So Jesus' response to this. In a world in a moment where his brothers are saying, go show them what you can do. Again, this is what's Jesus hasn't said this here, but this is kind of the conviction that is driving him in this moment. Is in Again, in the previous chapter, he says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them. Jesus has a very clear picture of what he can do and what's not his role. He understands that when people are following him, it's because the Father has drawn them to himself. In fact, his brothers would be an example of how witnessing the miracles of God does not necessarily produce faith, right? The same thing in John chapter 6. The disciples, the crowds had seen the miracles, the signs of Jesus, yet they still walked away in unbelief. And it's because Jesus has this conviction that it is the Father who draws people to himself. So, brothers and sisters, friends, as you think about the people in your life that you are longing to experience the things of the kingdom of God, 
you're longing for them either to meet Jesus for the first time because you know everything that he has to give them. Or maybe you're longing for that moment of breakthrough or clarity because they just feel so stuck. There's a peace that comes when you realize that you do have a role in the midst of their life, but ultimately is the Father who draws people to Jesus and provokes change in others' lives. It's funny, Oprah gets this. She says people change when they want to change, not when you want them to change. Oprah gets it. <laughs> Oprah gets it. Well, it's funny, there's a piece Oprah doesn't get. She says people change when they want to change. There's an element of that where change happens when we are ready. But I don't know if you've also been or experienced this. There have been things I've wanted to change in my life and I get stuck. I feel like I cannot be the person I want to be. I'm like that Romans 7 person over and over that I do the things I do not want to do. I don't do the things I want to do. And I think that comes back to this truth again, that Jesus understands that, yes, there is an element of human cooperation, of belief, of placing trust, but ultimately it is the Father who enables that moment of change. And so the, the thing the Lord has been working in my own life is I feel like I can be Lord and King over my own formation, over my own sanctification, over, sanctification is just the word of uh, the process of becoming more like uh, Jesus and who God has made you to be. I feel like I can Lord over that journey. And right here, Jesus is operating in the opposite conviction that ultimately that the Father is the Lord of that journey and he is the one who changes us. So if you feel stuck in that moment today, that that continual like log jam of effort where you're not going anywhere, this is an opportunity, a coming home moment, so to speak, of saying, Lord, I am at your mercy. Draw me to the heart of Jesus because I cannot get there on my own. I want to be there, but I cannot get there on my own. Then the third way we see Jesus' brothers at odds with what the kingdom is doing, or what Jesus is doing, is he's telling the Jesus in a sense to go faster. He says, leave, go, leave Galilee, go to Judea right now. Like this is your moment to capitalize. There's some urgency here. The people are gathered. It's right for the picking. Go get them. I don't know if anybody has waited on God before. I see some, there's some laughter. We can feel panicked or hurried or God, where are you? Why is this not happening? Like Jesus would have every reason to feel panicked. Like you sent me to this earth and I had a pretty good following and now they just all left me. Now what am I supposed to do? Yeah, let's look at, again, this is a conviction of striving Jesus. This was said earlier. He said this in John chapter three. So Jesus knows this about himself. He says, the son of man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. So just as Jesus knows what's not his role, he knows it's the father's role to enable the belief, drawing them to Jesus. Jesus doesn't have a clear picture of what his role is. That there will be this moment where he is lifted up on the cross. And that will be a demonstration to the world of who God is and what it means to trust him. And Jesus does not have to feel panicked or impatient because he knows his place in God's plan of drawing people back to himself. I feel like Jesus' ministry is a lot like, I know there's a few musicians in the room. And some, how many people have seen La La Land? Okay, most of the room. So this illustration will work for some people too. But there, at the end of the movie, 
uh, uh, Ryan Gosling, I can't remember his name, Step, is it Step? Step. Step. He, can you picture that moment where he's playing the piano at the end? Every note, so he's like, he's literally lost in the music. Time, it's almost like time has stood still for him. He presses every note so delicately. And he is caught up in that music. He does not rush ahead. He is intentional with every single note. And in some ways, I feel like that is the pace of Jesus's life and ministry, is he is not in a hurry to rush forward to that moment. He knows where the mo- he knows there's an ending moment coming, but he is patiently playing each note before that final chord. And he knows the role that the Feast of Tabernacles has to play in the midst of that journey. Jordan will be speaking at the beginning of the beginning of that role next week. But Jesus patiently and lovingly, in a sense, is lost in this song of the Lord, of the Father in heaven drawing people to himself and him knowing what his notes are to press in this turn. And he does not need to rush ahead in a hurried song. Perhaps the greatest contrast is when we think about when we think about our role in participating with God and what he's doing in our city and our families' lives, our spouses, our kids, neighborhoods, Perhaps this is the greatest point of contrast between Jesus' brothers and Jesus himself. Is your role in those people's lives, like think of those people, your kids, your spouse, your neighbors, like allow their faces to come to mind. Your role in their lives will look a lot more like dying for them as Jesus did for the world them being impressive to them, powerful to them, domineering and urgent over them. And Jesus is living with that conviction, not only in the scriptures, but towards us as well. Is he is more concerned with your heart than just impressing you? Is he is more concerned with laying his life down for you so that you can have the life that he intended as opposed to just having one more follower to tally up and impress the world with. Is Jesus sees each and every one of you. And just as you see those faces in your mind that come as you think about your family, your neighborhood, you two are being invited as a disciple into that journey of laying your life down for them. Not impressing them, although it can include moments of impressing, but laying your life down. Jesus knows the moment where his time will fully come. That moment, if you see in John, and I'm going to end here before we go into communion. There's this language of, of being raised up. And it kind of means our going up. It kind of points to three different areas. Of him going up upon the cross. Of him going up from the grave in the resurrection. And of him going up into heaven. That is the fulfillment of why Jesus has come. And he is patiently playing that song as the fi- until the final chord strikes at that moment. Will you pray with me? Jesus, in so many ways I can I confess um, from myself that there's so many times I am caught up in the ways of this world where I would rather be impressive or I'd rather have a big crowd as opposed to being concerned with uh, perhaps the the quality of investment that somebody has for me uh, the true nature of where their heart is Lord I pray that you would give us each strength as we're invited into that journey of two, laying our lives down for others as opposed to just impressing them 
domineering over them, that you give us the strength for that. And we thank you for the good news that you have gone first, that you have sent your spirit to enable every aspect of this journey, that we may be participants and recipients of the good news that you have died for us, that you have uh, resurrected and given us new life, and you have given us authority in your ascension. So we love you, Jesus, and we pray this all in your name. Amen. So the kiddos, are they coming in? Just straggling in.